All right, so after we have designed our components, we have everything we need to start building up the system. So that's what we do in the implementation phase. We actually start creating each component of the information system. We create the hardware, create the software, figure out all the database work and get the procedures done. And you know maybe wait a little bit on the people. We don't really hire them quite yet until everything is done, but we actually build everything. We test to make sure that everything is working and then we get the new system in place. We actually start converting the company to the new system. Now the actual building the system part of implementation is really important, but I really want to stress the importance of testing as well. <clears throat> you don't want to just build the system and then throw it out there and hope for the best. You want to actually get the best idea possible that the system is working as expected. That is what testing gives you, is it gives you, if you do it right at least, it gives you the best idea possible that the system is working as expected. And if you do it right, you'll also figure out what parts of the system are not working as expected and be able to fix them. And then once you fix them, you can continue testing until everything is right. And once everything is right, then you know, you're good to go. So testing, it ensures the systems are working as expected. The idea is that for each piece of the information system, for each uh, component, you're going to test that component individually. Now, if you have say multiple pieces of software, you're going to test all of those softwares. You're going to test how they interact with each other. If you're building the software itself, you're going to test that software extensively down to the figuring out like which lines of code are wrong and making sure that every single line of code has been tested thoroughly to make sure, you know, everything is behaving as it is expected. This idea of testing each constructed component individually is known as a unit test because you're testing every unit of the code. Then what you'll want to do is once every unit has been tested and everything is working correctly by itself, you integrate the systems together and then test the integration itself. You test the whole system by itself. And at this point, any issue here is almost certain to be due to some mismatch in the integration of all the different components, not within the components themselves. So you test the components, you make sure the components are working the way you want them to. Once that's good, then you can test the system as a whole to make sure that that is all running. And if you have issues when you're testing the system as a whole, it's probably an issue in how you put the pieces together rather than an issue with the pieces themselves. That's what's really important about testing in this way. You know that each piece works great and then you put them together and you figure out how, you know, what issues arise from putting them all together. An example might be you have a software that you have created, a database application that interfaces with the database itself that you are using. And you can test the software and feed it in some fake data or allow it to write to a pretend database or something like that. And you can make sure everything works great there. And you can also test the database, you know, you really make sure that all the right attributes are there, that it's structured the right way. If there are relationships, if it is a relational database, you know, you test that the relationships are right, all that kind of stuff. And then when you integrate them together, you know that the software is working great. The database is working great. But if there's an error now, then there's probably an issue in how the software is interfacing with the database. Maybe you expected the database to look a certain way when the software was being written, 
but the database actually looked a little bit different. And that shows you, hey, the data that you are communicating with the database isn't the, what you expected it to be, and that's causing issues. So that test illustrated an issue with the integration, not with the components themselves. I mean, you might need to change the software component in order to reflect what the database component looks like. If you've done it right, you probably won't have to do all that much work to fix that issue. So you're making a change in the software, but the fundamental parts of the software, you know, the, the actual behavior itself, you already know is working. So you could immediately pinpoint the issue to, well, they're essentially not speaking the same language. The, they're looking for different shapes of data and, you know, figure it out from there. So that method of testing is really helpful. When we have testing, we always use a test plan, which is a sequence of actions that users will take when they are using the system. You're essentially emulating what a user is going to do as they go about their business actually working with the system. You're pretending to be a user and you're looking for any errors that might come up when you are a user doing things. Uh, what you'll usually have is a series of expected system results. So as you test this user interaction with the system, you keep a note of what the system is actually doing and you compare it to the expected system results. So if I am requesting specific data from the database and that data is actually contained in the database, then I expect to get this result. Uh, that that kind of uh, that that's that's what we're talking about with expected system results. If I request this data from the database and the database has that data, then the database will give me this information. You can also test for like if I request this data and the database doesn't have it, the database gives me an error that says this, and you compare what your system is doing to these expectations. And if the database doesn't give you an error and it just gives you a whole bunch of junk data that you theoretically could accidentally use in further computations and destroy a whole bunch of stuff with, uh, that would be a sign that because it didn't match up with the expected result, you have to fix something. In testing, you would also do things like test for security. So when interacting with a database, for example, you might do uh, a SQL injection, which we briefly talked about in chapter 10, I believe, in order to see if you can completely erase the database uh, by entering in a, uh, a malicious uh, command into your database application or something like that. So checking to make sure all uh, user inputs are sanitized to make sure they don't have any malicious code in them uh, is very important important among other security considerations when you're testing you're going to include correct and incorrect user actions so you're going to have the user do the right thing interact with the system in the right way to make sure that it works but if the user tries to interact with the system in the wrong way for example putting uh, the word blah instead of the date in a report or in a form that is asking for the date, uh, there should be an error given rather than actually trying to pass it into the database and have something bad happen, for example. So you want to test that the user is doing the right thing. When the user is doing the right thing, um, that the system works correctly. But you also want to test that when the user does the wrong thing, the system gives them things like a helpful error to let them know, hey, this is an incorrect action. And also that it prevents the user doing the wrong thing from accidentally or maliciously destroying anything important. So you check to make sure that the user's uh, input that they are giving you or the actions that they are taking are correct. If they are not correct, you want your system to give them errors. You want them to prevent any actual actions from happening. All that kind of stuff. That all should be involved in testing, is making sure that all 
of that behavior is in place when the user does the wrong thing. Testing should test everything. You're going to test all lines of code in every custom software that you're making. You're going to test all programs uh, that you're working with. You're going to test all the hardware components. You're going to test all the procedures, maybe have some people pretend to be um, you know, actual users of the system and they will look through the procedures and then actually see if those procedures make sense and if they can successfully follow those procedures, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, people might be a little bit harder to test in the implementation phase, especially if we haven't hired the people or reassigned the people just yet. Although uh, people can be involved in testing, we'll talk about that in, in just a sec, but we're not necessarily testing the people component. We might be testing the job description component to see, um, you know, if those job descriptions accurately represent working with the system. I guess that'd be the closest we get, but we're not testing actual people. We are uh, allowing people to test our system. Again, we'll talk about that in a sec, but we are not testing the people. So there's a type of testing called alpha testing. I guess maybe more of a stage of testing. This is the testing that happens uh, internally as the system is being constructed. So, you know, each of the components might not be fully complete, but we'll still be testing as we go to make sure that the components we have built so far are working. So we don't end up getting too far into the actual production of that component and then realize, oh, there's an error somewhere in the system, but who knows? If you have a small piece completed and you're already testing to make sure that that piece works, then you know once, once you know that piece works, you can kind of move on and then test the new stuff that you've just built and maybe also test how the two new pieces work together. Kind of like what we're talking about with the unit testing versus integration testing, but on a bit of a smaller scale here, you want to test as you go. But all of that testing, before you really get to a finalized thing, is alpha testing. That is just all the internal testing of the system. When you're testing components individually, doing all that unit testing, that is all alpha testing. When you are working on the implementation, but you haven't quite finished it yet, you're just making sure the implementation itself is working and fixing things if it doesn't work yet, that all is alpha testing as well. Beta testing comes when you actually complete the system and you can't find any issues with any of the individual testing that you're doing. So all the internal testing is probably more, um, you know, running through test patterns and checking expected versus unexpected values, all that kind of stuff. That is going to be more on the developer side of things, all that alpha testing. Beta testing has a focus on letting users see how the system works and give feed giving feedback. So the future system users will actually test the assembled system by using it rather than testing functionality of each individual component or testing functionality of the whole thing. They are just using it and seeing how it works. Maybe they're given some direction on, you know, we want you to look at this functionality in particular. Can you use the procedures that we've given you and interact with the system in order to correctly do that thing? Um, that might be an example of a beta test and they'll give beta tests to a whole bunch of users. They might even just let them go wild with it. Just use the new system, see how it goes, report any issues that come up. Um, so the users will report the problems and the uh, vendor itself or the, um, you know, the, the people who are creating the new system will take those reports and they will fix the issue. Um, and then they will release an update. The, uh, users will just use the updated version and then report any problems and the vendor will fix those problems. And this cycle will continue. The product at this point should be complete and fully functioning. So 
in theory, all the components are working, the integration is working great, it should be a product that just works. And you should be able to do your job with that system. Um, However, there might be some errors that are hard to catch because, you know, you can only do so much testing. Uh, sometimes it can be hard to figure out every single needed thing to test. It can also be, uh, you can also have really, really, really complicated errors that only reveal themselves after a long period of use rather than just through shorter testing. So. At, at this point, um, it should be all but ready to ship. The beta testing just helps a developer identify final issues and fix those final issues before it's ready for release. So then, once an information system has been created and thoroughly tested, beta testing goes well, users have uh, either stopped encountering errors or the errors they encounter are minor and we're getting close to the budget limit or the deadline or something like that so we're fine with just leaving things as they are and dealing with very minor errors that don't stop a person from doing their job once we get to that point it's time to start using the new system and that's where the system conversion phase uh comes in we we talk about we call it system conversion because we're converting from the old system to the new. Uh, we're converting from whatever was being used in you know, the, the old days where everyone came together and decided we need a new information system for this. So that's why we're doing this whole process in the first place. We're converting from all of that to the bright new feature where our new system is running and everyone who needs to use it is actually able to use it. Uh, it's not super simple uh, because, and we've talked about this a little bit throughout the entire course, it can be really difficult to get people onto a new system. It can be difficult to update procedures and make sure that everyone is ready and trained and good to go with this new system that's in place. So system conversion can sometimes take a few different forms that try to account for these difficulties. We consider four types of con system conversion in this chapter. The first is going to be the pilot uh, installation. So pilot installation is essentially it's sort of like the idea of a pilot study, if any of you are familiar with the term. And I'm not talking about a pilot as in an aircraft uh, flyer, I suppose, but a pilot study in terms of, you know, a smaller study that you uh, actually take in order to give you some more information that will be useful for a larger study. That's a term that is used in statistics, where you can get some informa information from a pilot study that then uh, tells you what you need to do in order to do a full statistical study. We have a similar concept right here with a pilot installation. So if you have a large group of people who need to use this new information system, you can grab a selected smaller group of people, maybe a particular team or a particular department or something like that, and you give them the new system and say, here, have at it, see how it goes. The nice thing about it is if the system, despite all of your testing and all that kind of stuff, if the system still somehow fails, which is a possibility you need to worry about, if that system fails, then at the very least you've only affected a small number of people and there's this larger group of people who are still able to use the old system uh, and get their work done and then all that you have to do is just swap out the new system back for the old system for this pilot group and start doing some fixes on the new system so that's pilot installation 
you select a smaller group of users out of the entire population of users in your organization. You give them the new system and you let them use it and you make sure that it doesn't uh, explode, essentially. And if it doesn't explode, then you bring that system to everyone else. The next type of conversion is a phased installation. And this is not necessarily possible for all systems, um, but for systems that can be kind of broken into parts, for systems that are a little more modular and are able to interface with the old system to some extent, you can actually use a phased installation to gradually introduce the new system. So a phased installation essentially has you introduce the new system in phases. You bring in one piece of your information system and you test it and see if it's all working. You know, you have everyone in the business working with the old system, but also this new component of the new system kind of in there and you see if anything goes wrong. And if everything is fine, then you take the next component and you phase that in and see if anything goes wrong. And then you take the next component, phase that in, you take the next, next component, phase that in, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about components in the sense of like, you introduce all the hardware first and then all the software first and then the database for, uh, after that. That might not be possible. Uh, instead, it might be if you have a whole um, if you have a whole system that's taking in data from each part of your company, and it's taking all that data and it's trying to do something with it, and it's providing a unified database that everyone can access, sort of a ERP type of system. What you could do is you could introduce that new database into the marketing department and like uh, take the marketing department's uh, database put that into the new unified database give them that uh, introduce that software have that phase going first and then the next phase you could introduce is the customer service part of the system so you integrate their data into your new database and then give them the new application to interact with the unified database. And then you phase in the uh, accounting department, let's say. So you take their data, integrate it within your database, and then give them, and then uh, swap out their old database application for the new one. You, so you phase in that piece of the um, system and so on and so forth. Uh, this example that I gave, I recognize does make it sound a little bit like a pilot installation. Here's the difference. A pilot installation might be uh, just having marketing use this database system or even like a small section of marketing use this database system before you know you see if it works and then you give the entirety of marketing uh that database and then you give uh the entirety of the company access to this whole system or a pilot installation might be for each department in the company you take a small subset of that department give them the new applications and then have them work in this integrated database once everything there is going then expanded to everyone whereas phased might be one department at a time like i uh, mentioned uh now phased installation sometimes you have a very tightly integrated new information system uh, you can't really separate things because the database can't work without the new software that you wrote which has to run on the hardware that you built all those procedures you can't really apply them to your old systems they have to work with the new system and so on and so forth so in that case phased installation would not work and you might have to try one of the other methods here then we have parallel installation this is uh, certainly the most expensive um, 
at least up front is the most expensive because what you do is you use the old system and also the new system at the same time so you have two information systems that are doing the same thing uh, and it's completely redundant on purpose um everyone who works with the information system the old one and who will work with the new one has to continue working with the old one but they also have to do all the operations with the new one to see if the new one is working correctly and they have to do that for a whole period of time they're doing all this redundant work and then eventually um we make the determination on whether or not uh that new system can effectively replace the old system and once we make that determination then we phase out the old one and people are no longer doing redundant work they just work on the new system that theoretically would work a lot better um this costs a lot of money because you have to have the uh support structures for both the old and the new systems in place so that might mean paying for double uh the cloud uh, storage or computational power or something like that if you're using the cloud uh maybe it is uh taxing your inbuilt server and that is um you know costing you extra electricity or even you have to upgrade the server or replace worn out parts or something like that because of running these two systems at the same time also the redundant work means that you are uh, paying for labor hours that don't actually do anything uh, new you're paying for redundant work to be done you know the benefit is that you get to make sure that the new system works before you actually just put the new system in by itself so if you're willing to accept that as a cost then that could be worth it but it is a very high upfront cost the benefit of parallel installation though is that if the new system completely fails the old one is still there and there is no interruption in work unlike the phase installation or the pilot installation or something like that in those other two if something fails there is work being interrupted both are trying to minimize the amount of work that is interrupted if the new system fails but with parallel you have a complete uh you know safety net for failure of the new system which is really nice and then you have the plunge installation this is uh the most fun and scary and dangerous you completely yank out the new or yank out the old system and you put in the new and hope everything works just fine hope everyone is able to adapt to it hope that uh the whole system is able to handle the load of the entire uh, user population working on it you know and hope there's no freak accidents or something like that you just take the plunge you uh you you cannonball into the lake of uncertainty and new information system so that that is why they call it the plunge installation you're just taking the plunge into the new system now as fun as it can be to just completely yank out an old system and start using the new one you know you've, you've spent all this time building it all this money has gone into it and you really want to see it work it's going to be so much better than the old system it's so tempting to just take the plunge but it's not recommended in fact the first three are recommended over the plunge installation specifically because of the fact that each provides some sort of safety net um with plunge installation if the new one fails then you are out of luck and you have to hope that you can get the old one back and running um which could in and of itself be very tricky and no matter what if a plunge installation fails you have lost a lot of time and a lot of people are just sitting around um doing nothing so it costs the business quite a bit that's why it's recommended to do a more gradual installation like the pilot the phased or the parallel installations all right well that is implementation implementation uh, is the phase where the system is built 
all the components themselves are built up and then unit tested and then integrated and then system tested and then we go into the whole conversion so that's the whole implementation and once we're done we have an installed system people are able to use it people are able to generate value from information which is the whole idea of our information system class so perfect we're done we have a new information system we don't have to worry about anything else except sometimes things still go wrong it can be hard to correct errors sometimes things change and we need to modify our system so in the next uh, video we will be talking about how to address this how to address errors that come up after conversion how to address um, when we need to sort of make major updates to the system itself.